And so since 97, I've been researching, teaching, writing about all things black farming. Because, um, you know, one of the things that we do in anthropology is to, you know, preserve extinct species, extinct cultures. And so what I discovered when I began doing this work, that black farmers were extinct, becoming extinct. And not only that, no one even knew that they existed. So um, again, as I say, I think they chose me to tell the story. So today I want to share with you some black and white images, and I would just say stunning. That's probably not even a good word for it. Uh, by our dear friend uh, Michael Santiago, his work funded by the Alexia Foundation, and uh, which is a line by the Farms to Grow artist and resident, uh, photographer and resident. So I claim that. Well, let me just say a little bit about Farms to Grow. So as a result of the work, um, my academic work with black farmers, I graduated in 2002 and decided I wanted to do more. And so in 2004, I moved to Oakland with the collaboration of another farmer in Ohio, we started Farms to Grow. So for the last 10 years, what we've been doing is advocating, um, talking about all things that you know that tell the story of black farmers. So we started a farmer's market uh, two years ago uh, called Freedom Farmer's Market. I hope some of you have a chance to visit in June when we open, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the, the Q&A. But again, it's sort of an example of some of the work that we do at Farm to Grow as a way to um, support any kind of way that we can to support the sustainability of black farmers, keeping their land, and for the community to hear uh, the stories of black farmers and to see their faces. I have a couple of posters back there by um, some fresh fruit that you're welcome to uh, partake of. And it just shows you some images of black farmers. Some of you may have never seen a black farmer black farmer looks like. Um, I'll talk a lot more and hopefully you've had a chance to really peruse these images these, um, of Mr. James McGill. He's a pig farmer in Bakersfield, California. And it's interesting, um, I was in West Africa in 91 and some of his landscape really reminds me of, of Gambia. So it, you know, I found that before I even knew I was doing this work, at that point I was an English major and um, just still taking pictures, but now that I'm, you know, actually fully immersed in black farmers and material culture, I see that there is a continuity of landscapes from what I saw in West Africa, what we see here in Southern California. So I found that uh, not surprising, but, uh, you know, more supportive how certain things transcend time and space. So, um, James McGill, as I said, is a second or third generation pig farmer. His grandfather was a pig farmer. And if you notice these images, um, you notice something maybe a little peculiar about his landscape, you know? And uh, for a lot of people, they don't even, as I said, know what a farmer, a black farmer may look like, let alone what their farming landscapes look like. So I want to talk a little bit today about the material culture of America's black farmers. What, is, what does it look like? And I'd like for us to give a little bit more attention to, to the narratives and looking at um, how people use space, how they use land to make sense out of their lives, to make sense out of their lives over time and space. Now I wrote a 300 page dissertation about tradition and cultural continuity. And in, I guess, so we have about 20 snapshots here. I could have just as easily sort of taken these snapshots and put them in my chapter on material culture because they really capture um, a lot about how people make sense out of change and continuity. So what happened in a lot of the farms, like you'll see some stacks of old tires, um, uh, old rusted file cabinets, uh, some motorcycles, some ladders thrown about, and old boards that just look like they're just uh, like this one. Like it looks like maybe, a, you know, for an average eye, um, it may just look like uh, just a happenstance of materials. But actually it tells us a little bit about the underlying world view of people that inhabit these lands. And I call these legacy landscapes. 
and I call these people legacy bricolores. These legacy bricolores have transcended time and space. And historically, black farmers have used everything in their landscape, recycle, reuse, preserving materials, within a particular design, and I call it an African pattern, an African design. And I'll say a little bit more about that. And when you see these designs, they're not so sort of the pristine uh, gardens that you see typically in some of the mainstream farms. These um, farmers coming out of the enslavement period for, uh, had to survive. And for many things, they survived basically reclaiming the items in their environment, a type of a reuse. And part of this was also a type of a resistance. These landscape designs originate in a traditional African pattern, and they make a cultural statement. There's a, a discourse of space represented, a discourse of aesthetics that gives us a sense of innovation and how people create new uses of old things. The proverbial one man's jump into a storehouse of another man's reusable treasures. So no matter what they look like to us, black farmers during the enslavement period and after have utilized everything in the environment by necessity. They reuse things um, to make out of need. The rhythms of these choices, that's the thing that I'm interested in. How they combine to bring a type of aesthetic representation of old ways, and as I said, an African imprint. Now there are thoughts behind these aesthetic designs. And for black farmers, these thoughts have to do with needs and functions. There's a certain function of these designs. We can even look at these designs as a way to identify a world view, how people look at the world. Look at landscape to understand how traditions, and perhaps why traditions, have continued. These patterns of culture are real and proof that a worldview, an aesthetic perspective of the environment and the landscape can indeed transcend region, time, and space. So just viewing these agricultural landscapes tells us a lot about a, uh, a person's cultural use. Black farmers, small farmers, disadvantaged farmers, in general, have taken on farmers as just ordinary people. These, uh, there's nothing glamorous about farming, but for the, these farmers, they want to do it anyway. And understanding how these ordinary people have utilized their space and built a landscape behind them, uh, based, build a landscape around them based on their worldview is important. Mr. McGill, when you look at some of the arrangements, uh, and the recycled materials, they're rich in meanings, and rich in meanings for the owner. They're places of independence and self-reliance. Farmers are resourceful, they have to be. And so they value hard work, self-reliance, and they also value a certain sense of aestheticism in their environment. And so what I've been able to ascertain from my work with black farmers is that they're, uh, there's a certain pattern that we see within the context of the farming environment. And I think this distinguishes black farmers in the traditions of uh, how they farm from a lot of mainstream farmers. And these images capture what characterizes the black farm aesthetic on farmland. These vernacular farms there.